Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I'm your host. Today our guests are Jennifer Schuberth, uh, who is a co-founder of CORE, calling Oregon to reinvest in education. She holds a PhD in religion from the University of Chicago and is currently a professor of religion at Portland State University. Also, uh, we have Dr. Marsha Klutz. Uh, who is an assistant professor in English at Portland State University. She is granted a PhD in German studies from Stanford University uh, and is also a co-founder of CORE, Calling Oregon to Reinvest Education in Education. And this is our uh, second show with them. Uh, so if you weren't able to see them last week, you can go to our website, populistdialogues.org, and watch that program. Uh, so welcome to the welcome to your second appearance you. on our Thank show. Thank you for having right. us. Good. Yeah. So last time we were talking about um, education uh, in Oregon and actually transnationally. We talked a little bit about the difference between uh, fixed tenure and adjunct professors and and um, um, tenure line. Tenure. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and we talked about Western Governors University and how that model is um, is at least suspect. Uh, and so, t today we want to focus more on student debt, and um, uh, and how that has changed. So let me just start the conversation with: I graduated from Portland State in 1972, and when I graduated, I had. Um, I worked all the time while I was in college and actually in high school. And I, when I graduated from Portland State, I got, uh, I, I probably had about between $500 and $600 worth of debt. That's kind of not the case today. Yeah, I, grad I graduated today. with no debt at all. And when I no, tell like, my students that, there's just silence in the room. No uh, one can believe that that was ever even possible. Right, yeah, right. And how is it today? Their debt load is just staggering. They, I, I have students who end up coming back to graduate school and staying on because as soon as they leave school, the debt payments will have to kick in. And so uh, they end up enrolling in more and more and more courses because they can't. And more they and more debt. Exactly, yeah. more and more debt. <laughs> yeah, I have students with, with, with more than $200,000 in debt. Oh like It's the same as a mortgage, and they have nothing for it other than their education. And they can't use their education because to do so would take them out into the workforce where they would have to start paying it back. And so they get caught in these terrible binds. Hmm. The, the average is 25,000 is the number that floats around. Um, and I think uh, the, there's this number out there that there's a trillion dollars of debt. There was a lot of news last year that uh, it surpassed credit card debt. Um, and people started paying attention to this. But this has really been, um, a, especially the last 10 years, I would say. At Portland State, for instance, and we're pretty typical, uh, tuition has increased 100% in 10 years. Um, at places like uh, the California system within the UC system, in 2009, it was up 32% in one year. Whoa. Um, there were some student protests and faculty and what ha uh, mm -hmm. objections. Since then, it's gone up 10% or so every year. And they've even done it where you'll be in school for a semester, and then by the time you get to the next semester, it goes up again, so within the same year. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also see that if you take time off or the cost of not being able to get the class for graduation, and we, we hear also, uh, you used to be able to graduate in that, you know, it's a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. Almost no one finishes in four years. And some people say, oh, well, that's because the students aren't focused and things like that. Um, but really, um, from my experience, from what I've read, but also our experience at PSU, um, and uh, a lot of the California schools, literally students cannot enroll in the classes they need in order to graduate. So they're hanging around in order to take classes they need to graduate. And in the meantime, those classes just got more expensive mm -hmm. for them. So there's a combination of why these debt loads between the increasing and the um, uh, increasing just cost of it as well as the length of time it takes people. Mm -hmm. And most students are also working. As well, yes. I have students working two and three jobs. Mm -hmm. they don't you know have them falling asleep in how, the class because yeah. they're not able to focus. They just don't have the time to be able to juggle their work schedules with their testing. And they're, they're just incredibly stressed in a way they weren't 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I see a huge change. And if I bring up the issue of debt, 
there's this way that they kind of slump in their chairs. I mean, it's, you, you can see it how weighs. much fear there is. Uh -huh. It weighs. It, it, it has a huge psychological toll. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. When, when I went to school when, when I went to, at, at Portland State, I got a number of grants. Mm -hmm. Is that even possible? Do, do college students get grants anymore? There are some grants available, and I think you probably know the statistics better more than I do, but um, they have, as they increase grants and loans, they're, they're definitely shifting more to a loan system rather than a grant system, they keep kind of inc increasing tuition. So they're trying to kind of give what they call a high tuition, high aid model, which basically means that they can justify increasing tuition load for everyone by giving some financial aid to the neediest students. Mm -hmm. But even those are being offset more and more by, by a, a combination of grants and, and loans that the government issues. And do you know that? And I can, uh, we spoke a little bit in the last uh, um, discussion we had about declining uh, state funding in particular. And one of the things I think that is shocking to me is that uh, within this is within Oregon, but also nationally, it's actually less expensive for students to go to some of the Ivy League schools or some of the private schools because those schools do have what you're talking about, grants and endowments that, endowments that can fund these grants to students. So they end up getting out of school that the, the tuition is $40,000 or what have you, but they only paid much less than that. Uh, right. But you can see when you have something um, like a state school where most of the people going there would qualify at a private school for that aid, mm -hmm. not everyone can get it. And so there's smaller and smaller piles of money for more and more students that need it, uh, right? Um, and Portland State has exploded, for instance, um, as is across the nation, in the number of students. I mean, we're, we're I think we're past 30,000 now. Um, uh, you know, which is, uh, I think they were at 10,000 in two, 2000 only. I mean, the, mm -hmm. it's just uh, yeah. tremendous. And most of those students um, need some sort of aid. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Okay, it, but, but the, the level of funding from the state continues to go down. So how, how does that impact student debt? Every year as the level of aid goes down, the universities and colleges compensate by increasing the tuition requirements for students. And so students end up having to borrow more and more money in order to continue. And they are relying on the fact that people are so afraid in this economy that if they don't have a college degree, they won't find employment when they graduate. So there's this fear that, on the one hand, this debt load may not be something I'll be able to pay off. Mm -hmm. when I graduate, but on the other hand, if I don't go to college, then my chances of finding a job are almost nothing. So it feels like you're kind of like doing a kind of risk assessment. Like this is the, the, the place that we're putting young people into right now. Should I take my chances and just go into the workforce now and see what I can find when a BA is required oftentimes for just like even retail jobs? Mm -hmm. Or should I take the plunge and take out this debt and just keep building on it in the hopes that I'll be able to pay it off when I graduate. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's really catching students in this, this terrible bind where they have to kind of gamble with their own lives. And it's something that the finance agencies that are kind of targeting these students to give loans to are really taking advantage of. And they've developed a very well-honed language mm -hmm. for playing those fears against one another. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my next question was, who actually provides these grants or these loans? And what's that mechanism look like? Go ahead. Okay, so there's you can get private loans, but a lot of these are coming, and I'll I'll try to simplify it because that's one of the things that people have cr criticized. This nobody can figure it out. I mean, yeah. it's very um, complicated. Um, so it's it's almost like hedge funds. It is. <laughs> it's funny you should yeah. mention that. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's very much like hedge funds. Um, and so the. Uh, the private loan industry is probably going to grow as students need more and more, but the Department of Education, um, people are getting the loans from the Department of Education, but then they're being serviced by Sally Mae is the most famous, but there's others as well. Um, and so um, when I say service, it's the person you call, the person you're trying to talk to to deal with your debt. Um, and so these are federally backed um, uh, loans, but the... Um, the problem that, uh, when, when she refers to sort of this well-honed language that, that has been um, uh, developed by these um, companies is that uh, in the background what they're doing is they're lobbying and they have lobbied for um, 
basically the lack, total lack of consumer protection on these loans, as well as um, a, a special status with regards to bankruptcy that's just un, um, unparalleled. And so truth in lending laws that would apply if you went to get a loan to buy a house, for example, uh -huh. don't apply. Yeah. Oh. The different kinds of protection for you to be able to declare bankruptcy, if, for example, you lose your job and you're not able to pay your loan back, don't apply. All of the different protections that have been set in place for people who are borrowing money in other li in other li lines of work, or, there, there are exclusions that have been set up for students hmm. just in the, the past 10 years. And it has changed the shape of those loans and the, the mode by which they're collected radically. And I think most students don't have a clue how unprotected they are uh -huh. when they go into this. Okay. Yeah, and, and what's been the driver for this change? They will say that it's because if you buy a house, there's collateral. They can always foreclose your house. They can mm -hmm. take it back. Whereas if you have a student loan, you're basically your own collateral. They're investing in human capital. Oh, and uh -huh. so who knows whether you're going to make good on it or not. They don't have anything they can repossess. So that's been the claim for why these loans are special. In fact, what it means is that students walk out with a sense that they bear the weight of this extraordinary debt that the government has the power to help collect. So the Department of Education has basically formed an alliance with Sally May and the other loan collection agencies such that they can lay claim to your social security payments. If you're injured on the job, they can collect your disability. They can garnish your wages. So the government can basically help with their powers, their kind of governmental powers to enforce the kinds of collection, which is a very different mechanism then is available for other modes of loans. So this is the, the uh, public-private partnership to, to exactly. the disadvantage of students and, and most citizens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> my mind is kind of boggling at this whole prospect. It's As like, was well, mine when yeah. I first, right. because I think that um, I hadn't thought through what it means to not be able to discharge something in bankruptcy. And that's something, if you play out the logic, what it means is that the um, person you're dealing with, the person, you're, the company you're dealing with, they have no reason to actually renegotiate your loan, which they do, credit card or what have you, because they want a certain percentage mm -hmm. of if you go into bankruptcy, otherwise you're not going to get anything. And so what they do, and this is the part that uh, is just sh <laughs> sort of more shocking to me is they also have been given um, uh, with these lack of consumer protections they can add fees and fees and fees and so if you default and what default means is that you haven't paid for a certain number of times it's a certain um, sort of uh, relationship with your your debt so you haven't paid um, for X number of months you go into default and then a series of things happen and when those things start to happen they can start charging fees and so what you end up with is students that start off with twenty five thousand dollars in debt have eighty thousand dollars in debt and you say well Wait a minute, how did that happen? And what you see is now this is an income stream for that company for the rest of that person's life because they can come after you. You never discharge it. They can come mm -hmm. after your Social Security. If you think about the logic of that, wow. when will I be paying Social Security? <laughs> uh, well, the yeah. assumption is that you will still be paying off your student uh -huh. loans. And you can see how disastrous this is for us as a community as well. That means you're not buying a house or starting a business mm -hmm. or paying for, saving for your own students' education because you're sending $2,000 to Sally Mae every month. Um, and so that's the, for me, sort of putting these two pieces together <laughs> and seeing how this is a, a form of, in, you know, indentured servitude. Uh, yeah, that was the term that was coming to yes. mind. Yes, it right? is. Like and it people is. are beginning to actually to write about society. this. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, this is, this is very, very scary. And you think <laughs> that this has happened, actually you said that this is, this was just in the last 10 years that these laws have these been laws changed. These laws, 1998. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, who was president in 1998? Bill Clinton. Bill, Bill Clinton. That's Clinton. what I thought. Yeah. yeah. Okay, right, yeah. And so yeah. he would have signed this law. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a Democratic Congress would have approved the law. Mm -hmm. I th I'm no, sure. weren't they Republican? It's hard to remember. Uh, it is hard to remember. Yeah. It was blamed for both parties, I think. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah. But it's interesting to, to note that, that President uh, Clinton was the president at the time. Mm -hmm. that these laws changed. Um, but I have former students who I'll run into in town and they're just 
watching that lump of money that they owe grow and grow and grow. Mm -hmm. And they keep m making payments, but it seems that it gets bigger every time they look at it. Mm -hmm. And there's no escape from it. And you know, they're, they're, they're not finding the kind of high paying jobs that they thought would kind of make good on that venture they took when they started the mm -hmm. university, where they, they thought that they were investing in their future. And instead, they ended up with this enormous, it, it just feels like a ball and chain. I think, I think indentured hood is really a very apt mm -hmm. way of thinking about it, where it's like you're, you're not indentured to a private company. You're indentured to the social system as a whole with the government basically taking on the role of collecting your debt. So it's like the entire nation becomes your company store right. and there's no way you can ever pay it off. Mm -hmm. Well, this is not, not encouraging to, <laughs> for folks thinking about going to college, but, there's, but, but as you said, the alternative is getting the job uh, that pays you know, minimum wage or something, you know, certainly not living wage. Oh. Although I have one form, so this one broke my heart. He graduated and he got a job painting houses. And the guy standing next to him painting houses is like, man, you have a college degree. I have got to get a college degree. Otherwise, I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. <laughs> and my former student said, I'm probably going to be doing this for the rest of my life, too. And I've got this enormous debt to pay off, and you don't. So yeah, right. what's it gotten me? Which and I think a ahead. lot of young people are beginning to ask uh -huh. that question right now. Yes. Yeah, and I, I recall reading in the newspapers, you know, it seems like a few months ago where that was, that was kind of a headline about, you know, where uh, young people were saying, no, I can't afford to go to college. Not because, not because it wouldn't be some advantage in the future, but because it's just so expensive and the debt becomes so great that they can't afford to do it. And so uh, and legislators we become, tend to, oh, I'm sorry. Ultimately, we become an uneducated nation with that. It's yeah. true, yeah. yeah. And, and I, think, I think that right now, the way people tend to talk about the national economy is say, we need to send people to college. We need to have more and more of our people getting a, a, a degree <clears throat> to kind of help them be more mm -hmm. flexible in the workplace. And, um, Instead, I think the, the, the best thing one could do to stimulate the economy would be to declare blanket forgiveness for student debt because all of those people who aren't buying houses and who aren't starting families and who aren't investing money are just sitting back because they're so worried about that debt payment they have to make every month would be able to breathe freer and bring some real energy into mm -hmm. the economy. Mm -hmm. And there's a man, Robert Applebaum, who's, who's calling for this. He has a, a website and is, has been uh, talking about these issues, um, and that's one of them, a bailout for uh -huh. students. Well, very good. Yeah, <laughs> and do you know what the website address is? Um, it's not Applebaum. I, I don't. It should be part of the, um, the list I, oh, I okay. gave you. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But if I can plug a, a film, which I think sure. really outlines these problems um, and they have a lot of information it's called default the student loan documentary and it was independent filmmakers who are providing the film for free to colleges or anyone communities that wants to show this to have start having conversations about these issues they also have a great Facebook page where they put up information um, and they've been really um, getting people to see that this is not just this personal problem that makes people feel shameful, but this is actually a political issue, and this is a political problem, and this is not just accidentally happening. This mm -hmm. is happening because people lobbied millions and millions mm -hmm. of dollars because they're extracting <laughs> billions from you. Um, and starting to, um, there's a movement, I think, of people that are starting to say, oh, wait a minute, this isn't just my personal failing. And when you really understand the mechanism of how this works, mm -hmm. you can start to see that. But that's something that I think um, is, is beginning. That's, that's part of the um, education process we, need, we would like to be part of it's, as well. It's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge because in the past, people have managed to organize to demand change primarily through the form of unions, mm -hmm. where you're working and you say people are extracting profit from the work that we're doing here. Hey, if we all go on strike, they're not going to make their money. So we have a mode of control over what's happening here. But you're there on the factory floor with these other workers around you, and you talk to them every day. And when they're willing to take a risk, you're willing to take a risk. Whereas when they're extracting money from us primarily through the debt that we repay at the mm -hmm. end of every month, we pay those bills in the privacy of our own homes. 
we don't, or we don't pay them in the privacy of our own homes. We don't see that collective of debtors around us. Mm -hmm. And we feel a sense of tremendous shame and guilt. We're, we're often hiding from the bill collectors and we don't want other people to know just sure. how indebted we are. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to try to form a kind of collective organization that can begin to reach out to people in an economic model where they're profiting far more off of debt repayments than they are off of our labor. So I think that's the major challenge that we face right now is first unveiling the mechanisms mm -hmm. by which this mass extraction has been made possible and second by trying to get people to recognize that it's not that you've somehow mismanaged your life. It's that things were set up in such a way that you couldn't win this game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, it's the same kind of thing about foreclosures is that you know, the reason why people are in foreclosure is because of something they did wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so we're really talking about the same kind of thing. And, and of course, the, the foreclosure thing is very much very similar also because people have a hard time who are in that process of getting together and advocating for, for their interests as opposed to the bank's interest or the, or the, the loan company's interest. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there's a lot of commonality there. So what, what is happening? Is, are, are there some uh, efforts being made to... to uh, there, uh, the, Andrew Ross just um, founded a website where he's trying to, it's a petition, where if they get a million signatures, people will, a million student signatures, they will stop paying their debt repayments. So it's basically a threat of a debt strike. The, the question is, with this new restructuring in place, you can have a million students refuse to pay their debt and the government's just going to sit back with these default measures in place, start increasing their fines, start increasing the amount that they have to pay. They, they can all lose. Like they, the mechanism is there. They can deal with a million. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem. So I don't know exactly what kinds of strategies it would take. To me, it seems that people are just beginning to talk about what the possibilities might be. There have been some calls for strategic defaulting on foreclosure loans, too. And mm -hmm. the majority of people, 80% of people, think that it's immoral to walk away. Yep. Even if you're underwater, even if you're paying more than your home is worth, mm -hmm. if you have the ability to make that payment. So I think we have we have a kind of dual logic around around debt where on the one hand we think of it as a financial obligation but we tend to experience it as a kind of personal shortcoming mm -hmm. I freely chose to take out that loan by God I've got to be decent and pay that money back because it's how I prove to myself that I have integrity mm -hmm. and I think the banks are capitalizing on that ethos in the American public the corporations don't share it they don't mind yeah. walking away from loans mm -hmm. but on an individual level, I think we still hold true to that. And we need to find a way of finding our integrity in resisting the system that is abusing those kinds of places mm -hmm. where we find our ethics to be founded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then one, one of the other responses seems to, would seem to be that we need to demand and figure out how to lower the cost of tuition in the first place. Absolutely. <laughs> and I would it. say there's one other, Alan Collins, who runs, uh, wrote a very good um, book called The um, Student Loan Scam, I believe. Uh, and Student Loan Justice is his website. And he's calling for re reforming the bankruptcy laws. And he sees mm -hmm. that as you can do the strike, but really if you don't get rid of the bankruptcy laws, um, you know, this not being able to discharge them, that they can do whatever they want. And people are starting to actually talk about that. And there's um, student loans, I think they're called SLAP, Student Loan Action Project. Um, uh, there's a, a week of student debt awareness, February 27th to March 2nd. Right? So there's, okay. there's people that are starting to say that like, Cornell West is behind um, that and people that were in Occupy and things where they're also just trying to question these things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. all right. And, and any other, if, people in our audience are interested in connecting with you or mm -hmm. connecting with these movements, how do they do that? I think or, orcor.org, um, um, our Facebook page, we put up a lot of information um, about articles that are coming up, but also actions. And I would say um, default, uh, the, the documentary I referred to, has a very active community. It's an activist group that made the film. And they actually, uh, their Facebook page puts up actions going on all over the country. Um, you can look up things for local um, issues as well. And so, um, but between those two, I think you'll get linked to a lot of other people talking about this. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Uh, 
Any other responses to this crisis that you can think of that we haven't talked about yet? Well, I did want to come back to your point about the need to bring down the cost of tuition oh, yes. because yes. it has gone up at a phenomenal rate, four times the increase of um, inflation. It's, it's, it's ridiculous how much it's gone up. And the universities tend to blame that on faculty, imagining somehow that our salaries are so egregiously high that that's costing the students all this money. In fact, most of the money is going to hiring new levels of administration. Oftentimes they're trying to attract outside um, development projects, um, outside research projects that will bring in outside grants. Um, those tend to cost more than the grants themselves bring in. Uh -huh. They tend to hire a number of administrators who can do fundraising projects. Those often tend to have higher prices for the salaries than for the level of funding that they're bringing in. So many of the attempts they're making to try to bring in additional dollars end up driving the tuition increases themselves. So I think we need to focus on how the kind of corporate logic of focusing on the bottom line actually ends up costing students more money. Mm -hmm. um, when you just kind of stay with the way things are and stop building fancy new buildings to try to bring in out-of-state students, you can keep tuition, I mean, it, it will still increase, it, it, obviously, but it, it doesn't need to be increasing at this incredibly drastic rate. Mm -hmm. So we're, that's another thing that we're trying to do in CORE is really call attention to the places where the university is spending money in areas that have nothing to do with student success and education and trying to really ask them to, to, to be responsible with the funds that they are getting. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And I, I'm thinking right now, and we're only about a minute left, so I, we can't go into it, but well, one of the things I think was on your website it was about this new Oregon Sustainability uh, center, was yeah. Education Center, or, mm -hmm. or center uh, was, uh, was a very good uh, example of, of mm -hmm. real estate dealings exactly. by universities that are questionable. Yes. Right, yeah. So thank you, Jennifer, thank for being so here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcia, for, for being here. Us. Great. Good. Good. So that concludes our program for today. Uh, we want to thank uh, Marsha and uh, Jennifer for being here. So additional information can uh, on Calling Oregon to Reinvest in Education is available on their website, www.orcore.org, or on their web, on their Facebook page. Also, we have posted some additional uh, reference materials on our website, populistdialogues.org. Um, and let's see, the mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more, visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website, afd-pdx.org. Thanks today to our crew. We wouldn't be on the air without them. Joan Horton, Tom Thomas, Roger Bates, and Dave King. Thank you for watching, and we hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye. Oh, good.